If your family is surviving a deadly pandemic in a secluded forest home and a man just looking for supplies tries to break in, what do you do? I'm going to break down the mistakes made by the lone survivors, what you should do and how to beat the Black Death in It Comes at Night. Survivors of a plague are saying their last words to an infected family member, Bud, who is covered in boils and wheezing his last dying breaths. Afterwards, Sarah's husband, Paul, and their son, Travis, wheel him out to the woods. Travis tells his grandpa goodbye and that he loves him. Then Paul rolls the blanket over Bud, smothers him with a pillow, and shoots him in the head before rolling the corpse into a pre-dug grave and incinerating it with gasoline. Paul and his family are holding out the airborne plague in a secluded forest cabin. Not a bad choice. You want to be far enough from people to avoid infection and bandits, but close enough that you can make supply runs if necessary. I don't know how far from town their cabin is, but if it's around 30 to 40 miles, that would be good. If not, they should move further out. After Bud got infected, they kept him alive and quarantined him in a specific room lined with plastic sheets. This was extremely dangerous. Even with decent quarantine procedures in place, if someone makes one mistake or misses one spot, they're all dead. Paul should have executed Bud before he even took a step inside their home. It's a good thing Paul had enough gas masks to hand out like party favors. The ones they're wearing look high quality. Wonder how they got them, or who they got them off of. This probably isn't the first time Paul's used his revolver. The rest of their PPE is bad. If they were able to get their hands on those gas masks, they should have been able to snag some protective suits. The main problem I have is that they can still get infected by touching clothes that an infected person breathed on and then itching their nose. They need to dispose of their clothing, thoroughly wash themselves, decontaminate anything he touches, like the gas can and rifle, and decontaminate their gas masks before taking them off. The pillow silencer technique kind of works, as Demolition Ranch tested out. It's only going to drop the sound by 20% or so. It's better than firing in open air, but not exactly quiet. The pillow also helps to reduce the blood splatter. I still think it's a mistake. Ammo is scarce and the sound of a gunshot travels far. If Paul can stomach shoving a kitchen knife into his father-in-law's heart, that would be the best method. As for the disposal method, I don't think burning Bud was really necessary. The pathogen will die shortly after the host. Creating a giant bonfire will just bring more unwanted attention. Paul and his family have a solemn dinner and head in for the night. Travis has a nightmare that he's walking through their big red door into the quarantine room and sees his infected wheezing grandpa inside. When Travis approaches him, he shrieks like a screecher zombie. At the same moment, his mom wakes him up yelling that somebody's in the house. That has to be terrifying. You just had a nightmare of a crazed infected person in in your house, only for your family to panically wake you up and tell you that there might be a crazed infected person in your house. Sarah and Travis quickly put their gas masks on and huddle up behind Paul, who has his bolt-action rifle at the ready. Sarah's behind him with a the revolver. They all move in unison to the entrance that the intruder is banging on. It's the same big red door that Travis dreamt about walking through before seeing the infected person. Whoever is out there is determined to kick the door down. Travis stays back and muzzles their dog to avoid giving away their position. Paul moves to the right of the hallway, feet from the door and aims at it with his rifle. Sarah hangs back at the end of the hallway and aims the revolver at the door too. The intruder finally kicks the door down, but his flashlight blinds Paul, causing him to miss his first shot. It scares the shit out of the intruder, who then tries to escape out the back door. Paul cycles his bolt and advances on the intruder, ordering him to drop the shotgun, get on the floor, and roll over. The intruder hesitantly complies. Paul questions him to see if he's infected or if he has friends. The intruder replies no to both. Since Paul doesn't have handcuffs, he knocks him out with the butt of his gun and tries to peer outside to see if anyone else is out there. It doesn't look like it, but it's dark as fuck. Paul was just blinded by a flashlight and he's wearing a foggy gas mask. Paul leaves him for a few seconds to go get Sarah and Travis. He has them watch the unconscious man while he goes outside to confirm nobody else is out there. It's a tense couple of minutes waiting for Paul to get back, not knowing if Paul's going to get killed or they will have to kill this man. Paul returns and gives the all clear. They drag the man outside, tie him to a tree, duct tape his mouth shut, and put a potato sack over his head. The intruder wakes up shortly afterwards, but Paul and his family leave him there to marinate all day while they fix the broken wall and door. This is why I was against shooting Bud and burning the body. They were lucky the intruder made enough noise to wake them up and that they had a watchdog. They should have rigged up lines with bottles or cans with rocks in them as crude early warning systems, as well as traps for humans and animals. Paul should have the skills and supplies to set up snare, deadfall, mace, whip, or punji pit traps. For bait, he could make little loot piles that a survivor might have left behind. A torn backpack with some goods hanging out. A broken tent with a cooler next to it. Subtle things that would draw in unwanted visitors. Just make sure everyone knows where all the 
traps are. Paul and his family did a pretty good job. It's clear they pre-planned and rehearsed what to do if this situation were to occur. They had their gas masks and weapons close by and knew how to operate them. Everyone knew where everyone was and where to meet up. As legendary tactical instructor Clint Smith says, don't learn new shit in the middle of a fight. Many families would have been splitting up, unable to find their gear or each other, unable to operate their gear with half of them running and the other half wondering where they are. I think it was a good decision to stay together. A lot of home defense advice instructs people to have their wife and kids hide in a room while they clear the house by themselves. This is predicated on the fact that the police are on their way and your family is defenseless. Sarah knows how to use the revolver and Travis can fight or render aid. Sarah and Travis also need to be able to know if Paul gets shot, killed, or overwhelmed so that they can decide to help or run. Once up, they all fell into formation and moved to the threat area to surprise their assailant while staying quiet. You could argue that they should have slinked out the back door or hid in a room to avoid confrontation. I think that they made the right choice to confront the intruder. Their supplies are scarce and making supply runs is dangerous, if there are any supplies left. Finding another home is difficult and potentially pointless if intruders like this are ransacking every home in the area. The intruder could be infected too. They can't let him potentially contaminate their entire house and all their supplies. I also agree with their decision to stay quiet and to not try to deter him by yelling that they're armed and dangerous. All this does is give the intruder a chance to leave and come back when he can surprise you. Paul's decision to move up front was a mistake. This put him in the line of Sarah's fire and made maneuvering impossible. His position was overcommitted. If three guys stormed through the door, Paul would have been massively fucked with a bolt action and nowhere to move. If he tried to run back down the hallway, he risked getting shot by Sarah or the intruders in the back. Paul should have stayed at the end of the hallway with Sarah to clear the lines of fire and so they could safely retreat if necessary. Paul did make a good decision to attach a flashlight to his weapon. A flashlight is probably one of the most important up upgrades you should add to any weapon. It's imperative for target identification, and it helps to blind the enemy as we saw. After the man broke in and Paul missed his shot, he immediately reloaded and advanced to neutralize the threat. This is what you'd want to do for the same reason as mentioned earlier. If you let him regain his footing, he will either leave to attack you when it's more favorable for him, or get up and start shooting back. Paul had the intruder off his feet and correctly took advantage of it. I'm surprised Paul didn't shoot the man when he swung his shotgun at him. The intruder could have pulled the trigger and blown Paul away. Paul's detainment procedure was pretty on point. Once the intruder dropped his gun, Paul kicked it far away so he couldn't go for it. He also kept his distance from the intruder to prevent him from being able to grab his gun. He had the intruder lie face down to see if he was carrying a pistol on his hip, then roll over to see if he was sick. Paul opted to rifle butt the man unconscious before detaining him instead of calling Sarah and Travis over to tie him up while he stood guard. Either way works, I guess. His communication with Sarah and Travis was difficult with the gas mask. Walking back through the door Sarah was aiming at after disappearing with the intruder was dangerous. He should have attempted to yell that he's coming out and not to shoot. Paul walking outside through the door where the shots were fired with his flashlight on to go see if the intruder had friends was a bad move. If this man had friends, they would have been watching from the side he entered on and opened up on the big light bulb wandering in the yard. He should have exited from a different side of the house with his flashlight off and snuck around the tree line perimeter. By sneaking around from a different side, he could come up on their flank without them knowing. Paul did knock on his return, which was good. Don't want to be barging in with Sarah and Travis on a knife edge. I see no faults in how they tied the intruder up. Now they just need to determine if he's a threat and if Paul needs to widen Bud's grave for one more. This is a hard one. If you let him go, he could bring friends back to murder your family. If you kill him, you have to live with the possibility that you murdered an innocent man. Paul and his family leave the intruder outside all night as well. They're waiting long enough for any symptoms of infection to show up before they even think of what to do with him. It took Bud a day to start showing symptoms, so by morning they should know. That night, Travis has another nightmare. This time he walks out into the woods where the man is tied up and sees him intently staring back with black eyes. The next morning, Paul checks the man's eyes, face, and hands for signs of infection. He's not showing any symptoms, so he takes his gas mask off and ungags the man to interrogate him. He shows the man his loaded revolver and a gallon of water and tells him that if he gets honest answers, he'll get the water. If not, he's going to be biting the the pillow. Paul asks his first question, why did you break into my house? Will replies that the house appeared abandoned and he was only looking for supplies for his wife and child who were living in a house 50 miles from here. He says they've been living there for a week and that he left them not because they were sick but because they were running out of supplies and he thought it was safer to go alone. 
Paul asks how the intruder got to the abandoned house they were staying at. Will says their truck broke down and that's the first place they found. Paul asks where he was before that. The man replies that they were at his brother's house. Paul asks where his brother's house is. The man says 80 miles from here. Paul asks why he left his brother's house. The man says they lost their water supply. Paul asks where his brother is. Will says his brother is dead and that it's just his wife and son and nobody else. Paul asks if he has any idea what's going on out there. Will says no. He only knew people were getting sick in mass and immediately headed for the hills. Since then, he's stuck to the woods and only driven at night to avoid being spotted. Will pleads he's telling the truth and that he has two goats, six chickens, and some canned food he can trade for water. Paul asks him if his animals are healthy. Will says yes. Paul feigns being satisfied with the man's answers and gives him some water before reconvening with his family to discuss what to do with them. Sarah asks Paul if the man mentioned seeing the smoke from Burning Bud's body, thinking that's probably how he found them. Paul says he didn't. Sarah thinks that if the man has a family, they should consider bringing them back here because if Will found them, others could too, and it'd be better to have more people around who could defend the home. And Will's family could bring the animals. She's confident that it's the smartest option. When the apocalypse hits and danger lurks around every corner, it's tempting to hide in a secluded house and turn away all who seek aid. I can't blame Paul, but at some point you need to find people you can trust, build relationships, and create a well-armed community. The Walking Dead TV show is a great example of survivors building a community under constant siege. The show is ending, but the battle against the undead hordes rages on. Join the fight and develop your team-based survival strategy skills with this video sponsor, The Walking Dead Survivors. As the lead Leader, you have hard choices to make. The first is who to trust and recruit. Rick Grimes asked newcomers three questions to gauge trust and ability. Paul blindly took in a bunch of suspicious randoms he didn't vet or trust. Don't be like Paul. Recruit carefully. Trust is critical, but useless mouths to feed won't help you survive. Each survivor has unique attributes and skills best suited to certain tasks. Some better for different types of combat and exploration, others for healing and production. What tasks you give them and how you position them in the base you built will determine whether or not the hordes feast on your innards. Humans are unpredictable, but if you want to beat Negan, you'll need to form clans with them in order to build strongholds, gain territories, and strengthen your forces. As evil as Negan is, he's a superior leader to Paul and not to be underestimated. I'd suggest banding together with fellow nerds. Join the community of survivors by clicking the link in the description to download the game. Use the code TWD Survivors to get in-game rewards. Tying Will to a tree in the woods and leaving him there until they could see if he developed symptoms of infection was smart. Smarter than housing him in a makeshift quarantine room like Bud. I know Bud was family, but they could have set up a little tent outside. However, leaving Will out in the woods by himself while they slept inside wasn't smart. Will was bound securely with a thick rope, but eight hours is a long time that Will could have spent rubbing it up and down on the tree bark. And if Will did have friends hiding in the tree line, they might be able to free him. Paul should have secretly kept guard from a distance without him knowing. If anyone tried to free Will, he would know Will was lying and could shoot them. There's also got to be wolves and packs of hungry stray dogs roaming around. You don't want to have to live with yourself having let a potentially innocent man get eaten alive. I think it was a mistake for Paul to take his mask off this early. Like Will, Paul and his family booked it out of town when the pandemic hit. Paul seems to be basing the infection timeline solely off of how long it took Bud to show symptoms. Will is younger and healthier, and his symptoms might take longer to show. Who the hell knows for sure, and with how deadly this disease is, why risk it? Paul should have immediately interrogated Will as soon as he woke up. By leaving him out for 24 hours, he gave Will plenty of time to craft a convincing story and get his alibi straight. In order to break Will's alibi for every main question, Paul needed to ask very specific follow-up questions that are hard to prepare answers for in a zigzag chronological pattern that can cause lies to trip over each other. For example, What's Will's current home look like? Is it residential? How far from Will's broken down truck was this home? Where did he get the animals if his home was residential? What happened to the owners of the animals? How did they survive without the owners for this long? If he got the animals before his truck broke down and their latest home was a 10 mile hike, how did he transport two goats and six chickens along with all their other stuff with only a wife and toddler? Some people claim that a person's eye movements can reveal if they're lying, but actual studies haven't found any correlation. Will said he 
and his family were staying at a place 50 miles from here. This is suspicious to me. If your truck is broken down and you only need water, how and why are you 50 miles from home? Surely there's enough water between your home and ours. Does he not know how to make a rain catcher or distill water from a stream? Paul needs to write every answer down in order to see if there's any way to trip him up later or if anything doesn't make sense. Then come back at the end of the 24 hours to assess him for infection and re-question him about the specific details he mentioned the first time. There's no obvious signs that Will is lying, and if he does have animals and a family in need, they could help each other. Paul's family doesn't seem to be short on food or supplies, but more is better. They could let Will go, pack up their supplies, and move to a new home. This is dangerous not to mention an immense pain in the ass. I don't think Will is a bad guy. If he and his friends did see their fire and were intent on looting them, Will wouldn't have come alone at night and loudly banged on their front door. They would have ambushed Paul and his family when they were outside with their guard down in the morning. Will is still a complete idiot for trying to loot unknown houses at night. The best option is to drive Will back to his family. It's the only way to be sure he's not lying and going to come back and kill them later. Paul agrees to drive Will back to his family. His plan is to untie Will and put him in the bed of his truck with three to four days worth of supplies plus extra for Will's family while he drives solo. Will will give him directions through the back window as he drives. Paul will then stay with Will's family for three days to make sure that they aren't sick. Then he will drive Will's family back to his home. Meanwhile, Sarah and Travis will stay behind and hold the fort down. They are not to go looking for Paul should he not come back after four days. I like this plan, but I don't think Paul should have left Will untied in the back of his truck with his gear. If Will was lying about his family, he now has enough room to run off with Paul's gear and attack Paul's family later on. Paul should have kept Will tied up until they reached his alleged family. Only then can he start to trust Will. As for Sarah and Travis, if Paul isn't back in four days, they should grab what they can and move homes. Whoever killed Paul might have discovered where they live. Also, if Paul needs three days to be sure they aren't sick, why didn't he wait three days before breathing the same air as Will? If the disease took a couple hours or days longer to show symptoms than his original 24-hour timeline, he's already exposed himself and his entire family. When Paul questioned Will, Will mentioned that he only drove at night. I think this was a smart decision. Survivors will be active during the day, could hear your car coming, and try to ambush you. By driving at night, most people will be asleep, and even if they heard your car, they wouldn't be able to prepare an ambush in time. Will didn't have a map on him, so his judge of distance could be way off. I'd guess he overestimated the distance and lives closer by. Paul doesn't need to worry about any pre-planned ambushes, as there's no way Will could orchestrate it. But Will could try to lead Paul into his group of bandits' hideout, throw all his gear out of the truck, and then try to attack him. For this reason, Paul should have tried to get as much of Will's directions ahead of time by having him point out the roads and landmarks on a map, and then try to take a different route if possible. Keeping Will tied up in the back also ensures that if shots are fired or Will tries to pull anything, he'll be eating a bullet too. Not much else Paul can do. It's a risk he's gonna have to take. Will hops into the back of the truck and Paul starts driving while keeping a close eye on him through the rear view mirror. Shots ring out and bullets start hitting the side of their car. Paul veers off the road into a ditch. He's able to stop the car before he totals it on a tree. Paul immediately gets low, grabs his bolt action, and gets around cycled into the chamber. More shots hit the car. Hard to tell from which direction. Paul crawls out of the driver's side door and under his truck, looking for any movement. He hears Will jump out of the bed of his truck and hide. Moments later, an armed man steps out from behind a tree. Paul aims carefully and takes the shot. He hits the man in the leg, dropping him to the ground. It's not a kill shot, though. The man tries to go for his gun, so Paul takes a second shot. Missed. He fumbles with the action to get another round in the chamber, then takes a second to calm himself before pulling the trigger again. His third shot hits the man square in the side of the chest, putting him down for good. Paul gets up from under the truck and sees Will on top of another man, pounding his face in. He tells Will to get off of him. Will sees Paul take aim and yells for him not to kill the man. Paul executes him anyways. This causes Paul to reload and aim his rifle at Will, suspicious of why he didn't want him to kill the man, thinking they knew each other. Will yells back that he wanted to keep the man alive so they could question him, see what's going on, and if they were a part of a bigger group. Paul lowers his rifle and throws Will a gas mask and some water to wash his hands with and gets his own gas mask on. He has Will fix the flat tire while he grabs the guns off the bodies and drags them into a ditch. This likely could have been prevented by driving at night. It's easy to say Paul should have kept the wheel straight and hit the pedal, but it's understandable that you'd swerve and lose control with shots hitting your vehicle. At least he kept his car from getting totaled. Paul's rifle should have had a round in the chamber already. Not only did he have to waste precious seconds fumbling with his bolt while under fire, he now only has four rounds 
rounds in the gun instead of five. Crawling under the car was a mistake. He should have gotten behind the engine block or retreated behind a thick tree. By crawling under the vehicle, he severely limited his mobility. If someone were to come up on his flank and start taking shots at him, he'd be a sitting duck. Paul did a good job of keeping his cool and making his shots count. They were unlikely to get any answers out of the man, but it still would have been worth a couple minutes of their time to attempt to question him before killing him. Since Will was hand-to-hand -hand fighting with them and is covered in his blood, it's safe to say he's potentially infected. There's no need to give him a gas mask or waste water on him to wash his hands. He just needs to get in the back of the truck and quarantine for another day, or three, I guess. Paul and Will return with Will's wife, Kim, and their toddler's son, Andrew. Paul gives them a tour and the ground rules. The big red door he broke in through is the only way in and out of the house. It always stays shut and locked up. If they need to go outside, either Paul or Sarah will have the key to unlock it. Paul's most important rule is to never go outside at night unless it's an absolute emergency. During the day, they always stay in groups of two. If they have to use the loo at night, they use buckets to avoid going outside to the outhouse. The next morning, Paul gives Will the patrol route. Will shows Travis how to chop wood. Sarah shows Kim how to distill water, Kim shows Sarah how to tend to the animals, Travis shows Andrew how to color within the lines, and they all return back home for the night to play board games like one big happy family. That night, Travis has another dream. It starts out hot and wrong, but mostly hot, until she starts drooling black bile into his mouth. Travis has a hard time going back to sleep after that, so he goes to the kitchen for a snack. Kim is there. They have a nice little chat. There's definitely some tension in the air. The next morning, Travis is getting distracted watching Kim pump water while he's supposed to be chopping wood. When Will leaves to haul away a bundle, Paul steps in to tell Will that no matter how good they seem, they still can't trust anyone but family. The father-son lesson is interrupted by their dog, Stanley barking at something off in the forest. Paul tries to calm him, but Stanley rapidly bites his leash free and runs off. Travis chases after him until Stanley disappears over a ridge and his bark is silenced by whatever's out there. Will and Paul catch up to him. Paul's pissed that Travis took off like a loose cannon and forces them to retreat back to the house. Bringing the family back is a significant risk. That said, it's worth the risk given Will already knows where they live. On their way back home, Paul should have made certain that nobody was following them by periodically stopping at random locations to ambush anyone tracking them and taking different routes to obscure the true path to his home. When Will's family arrived, Paul should have gone through everything that they were bringing into his home and then gone through their belongings multiple times when they were outside completing tasks. This is to ensure Will's not breaking any rules or has any weapons stowed away that he could use to kill them and take their home with. Paul's ground rules make sense, especially using buckets at night. Stumbling over to the outhouse at night by yourself is a proven way to get killed. It's good that he and Sarah have the only keys in and out. While Will and his family seem like good people, I agree that they should keep a close eye on them, if not just to make sure that they don't make costly mistakes. Giving Will a firearm to keep in his room is a total mistake. When inside the home, all firearms should be stored in a locked safe in Paul's room. When outside, Paul should have two firearms on his person. That way, if they come under attack again, Will can help them fight back. Until then, and for a long time, the firearms should primarily be in the sole possession of Paul's family. This should be agreeable considering Paul spared Will and this is his home with his supplies that Will might want to take if there's a disagreement. Travis is a little weird, but sneaking into the attic above Will's room to eavesdrop isn't a bad idea for the first few days. I can't blame him for getting heated at the sight of Kim. It's the apocalypse. Not many women around. Except Kim is Will's wife. He needs to stow that sh** before it stirs up conflict and misjudgment that could cost someone their life. Kim needs to chill with the advances too. Will almost got killed twice for you. Show some damn respect. Travis was seen walking Stanley with a proper leash before, so there was no reason to tie Stanley down with a brittle piece of twine. It doesn't take a genius to realize that your dog will go ape shit if it senses something lurking in the woods, and that twine will easily snap. I also can't blame Travis for running after his doggo. Once they reached the ridge line, Stanley was silenced behind. They should all three have advanced, with Paul and Will coming wide around the flanks. Stanley might only be wounded, or he might have gotten trapped by a roaming hunter. It'd be better to find out what was lurking in the woods than to be left guessing what threat is out there. They should look for any tracks, blood trails, a knife or bite wound in Stanley, or anything to determine what was out there. Paul forced them all to retreat, not wanting to risk their lives for a dog. What he failed to understand was the tactical and psychological significance of Stanley. Stanley was the one that warned them that something dangerous was out there, and most likely alerted them to Will's break-in attempt. He also means a lot to Travis, and in the apocalypse with few comforts, losing his dog could break him psychologically. They'd be lucky if it was another animal. If it's a person, 
they need to plan for it. The best course of action would be to turtle up in their home for five to seven days on high alert with gun safes unlocked and weapons loaded. Obviously, little Andrew will need to be watched closely. Without Stanley, they should be taking guard shifts 24 hours a day, looking through peepholes for any movement or to retrieve Stanley if he comes back. Based on Bud's infection to death timeline, one week should be long enough that a sick person would die off. If it's a non-sick bandit, they're probably out here because their supplies are thin. In that case, one week will force them to run through their supplies and attack your stronghold head on, or move on to somewhere else. After that week, Paul and Will should very cautiously patrol a wide perimeter for another week before they can start to ease up a bit. Later that night, Paul sees how devastated Travis is and tells him they'll look for Stanley at first light. Will's been nothing but good so far, so Paul invites him down to Bud's cellar to share a drink and talk about their pasts. When Paul asks Will about his family, he says that he was an only child, contradicting the story he told Paul earlier about his and Kim's activities prior to finding the abandoned house. When questioned about the brother he said he had, Will says that it was technically his brother-in-law. Paul's clearly not convinced and says that he's gonna head off to sleep. Travis wakes up, possibly from another nightmare, and finds Andrew lying on the hallway floor for some reason. He wakes him up and takes him back to his parents' room. On his way back to his room, he hears a thumping sound downstairs. He goes to investigate it to make sure it's not just squirrels or something. There's more thumping noises coming from the main entrance. It looks like the door's unlocked and open. Then a loud bang hits the door. He runs back upstairs and alerts everyone that someone else might be trying to break in. Everyone takes positions as they planned and rehearsed. Paul, realizing it was Stanley, opens the door. It's not good. Stanley's sick, bleeding profusely and wheezing hard. Paul has Sarah take Travis back inside and shoot Stanley to put him out of his misery. That same night, they take his body outside and burn it. Paul holds a meeting. He thinks only Will and himself should go outside for a while until they have a better idea if it was an animal or a sick person. Paul asks Travis to confirm that he never went inside the room. Travis says he was positive he didn't. Will follows up, trying to confirm that Travis was the one that opened the door. Travis denies even having touched the door and says that it was already open when he got there. Everyone starts becoming suspicious and blaming one another. Travis suspects that Andrew might have tried to open it while he was sleepwalking. Will fires back that Andrew's too short to have opened the door and that maybe Travis forgot he opened it in all the chaos. Paul seems to side with Will but intervenes and tells them that their family should spend a day or so separate from each other to cool off and make sure no one's infected. There's a lot of distrust and animosity between the families now, which started with Will's suspicious comment about his brother. This is why Paul should have recorded Will's answers on a notepad, then questioned him another 24 hours later. These discrepancies likely would have started showing up. When he first met Will's family, he should have immediately taken Kim aside and cross-checked Will's answers without him present, and before he could mend their alibis. After bringing Will's family back, Paul could still use the notepad full of specific answers to craft questions that could trip him up over the course of a week or two of living together. When Paul first heard Will's contradictory comment about being an only child, he should not have pressed Will on it. Instead, he should have changed the subject, then later independently and subtly questioned Kim about it. While it's strange that Will would refer to Kim's brother as his own, I can't think of why Paul would initially have lied about a separate brother that died. By pressing Will, Paul exposed that he thought Will might be lying. The distrust he made overt is now festering in uncontrolled ways. The door being opened is a huge problem. There was no sign of break-in. Someone unlocked the door. Only Paul and Sarah had the keys to unlock them, which were kept on their nightstand. None of them had any motive or inclination to go outside at night. The only person who had the motive and access to the key was Travis. Travis was intent on getting Stanley back. He might have heard Stanley bark that night and snuck out to find him since Paul would never have allowed it. After seeing Stanley torn up, he might have dragged him back into the living room and called for help to see if Paul and Sarah could save him, then fabricated a lie and tried to poorly shift the blame on Andrew. There's no other explanation of how the dog got inside the first door. The details remain unclear, but the fact remains. Travis is the most likely suspect. Tough sh since they all shared a dinner table, which was a dumb decision after a breach in containment occurred. The only thing they can do now is quarantine from each other and pray they aren't infected. After Stanley went missing and knowing that Travis was distraught about the situation, Paul should have secured the key to better prevent Travis from doing something stupid like this. Travis has another nightmare. In it, he hears Stanley growling in the distance and sees the main door open. He walks outside to follow the sound of Stanley snarling and finds Stanley in a vicious struggle with something. Travis awakens, still in the nightmare, and 
starts puking black bile and scratching his arms, which are covered in boils. Bud's sitting across from him, black eyes, wheezing and begins to shriek. This wakes Travis up for real. According to everyone else, the mystery of who opened the door is still unresolved. Travis, looking for any evidence that would absolve him of suspicion, eavesdrops on Will's family again. He hears Andrew crying and Kim telling Will that they need to leave. Travis hurries back to tell his parents that he thinks Andrew is sick. Paul and Sarah grab their guns and masks, then go over to Will's bedroom and ask if they can check on Andrew. Will begrudgingly opens the door, asks if Sarah and Travis are there, then quickly shoves a gun up to Paul's head. He takes Paul's gun, forces him into the room, and has him take his mask off. Will says he only wants to leave with a fair amount of supplies, and threatens Paul that he will kill him if he goes near his family. Will has Kim take Andrew downstairs, then has Paul follow them at gunpoint. Before they can get halfway down the stairs, Sarah emerges from a side room with a rifle trained on Will. She hesitates to shoot, wanting to give him a chance to de-escalate. They both agree to lower their guns on the count of three. Paul capitalizes on the distraction to disarm Will and knock him to the ground. Kim tries to flee with Andrew, but is run down by Sarah. While all this is going down, Travis is hiding in their bedroom. Paul and Sarah force Will and Kim outside into the woods. Will thinks that they're about to be executed, so he fakes being too wounded to move. When Paul tries to pull him forward, Will tackles him to the ground and starts bashing his face in with a stone. He gets a few good swings in before Sarah shoots him in the back. Kim sees Will get killed and tries to run off with Andrew again. Paul's f***ing pissed and not about to leave loose ends that could bite them in the ass. He grabs the rifle from Sarah and fires at Kim. His first shot misses her and kills Andrew. Having lost everything, Kim pleads for Paul to just kill her too. Paul obliges. Paul, Sarah, and Travis all go back inside to rest. The next morning, Travis wakes up with boils all over his body, his mother telling him that he can let go now. Paul and Sarah both sit at the table looking at each other. Their father is dead, their son is dead, they ended up having to kill another man, woman, and child, and they're probably sick too. At this point, their deaths will be a mercy. Travis's nightmares might be a mix of repressed memories, nightmares of his memories, or just plain nightmares. I think deep down, he knows he was the one that brought Stanley back in, infecting himself, infecting Andrew by taking him back to his parents' room, then most likely infecting everyone else by mingling. It goes without saying that Travis should never have gone after his dog at night, especially without any protective gear. It also goes without saying that since he did, he should have quarantined himself. Paul and Sarah were equally to blame. They should never have left the entrance key out for Travis to swipe after seeing him run off after Stanley like that. Upon finding the door ajar, they should have immediately quarantined from each other, especially from Travis since he's the primary suspect. I think Paul knew Travis opened the door, but he just couldn't accept that Travis sowed their demise and thus ignored the possibility entirely. When Travis told Paul he thought Andrew was sick, this gave Paul an outward enemy to project his failure on. I'm not sure whether Paul's plan was merely to quarantine Andrew if he was confirmed to be sick, exile them, or execute them. Paul told Travis that desperate people are dangerous and they couldn't take any chances, which sounds like door number three. Living in harmony is no longer an option, with all the distrust from Will's contradiction and everyone blaming each other for opening the door. No matter which one was his intent, his method for exiling or executing Will's family was too overt and confrontational. For exiling, Paul should have told Will he confirmed that Travis opened the door, that he understands if they don't trust Paul's family anymore and want to leave. He should have told Will that their truck was gassed up, loaded with a fair amount of supplies, and that they're free to leave. There's still a good chance Will will be on edge, anticipating that Paul won't let them leave. The only way to be sure that Will doesn't try to kill them or take their shit is to have overwhelming firepower. Paul, Sarah, and Travis all should have been present with firearms for the eviction notice. Not only was Sarah not present for some dumb reason, but Travis was totally absent as well. If Paul's plan was to execute them, he should have kicked the door down without notice and shot them all dead. It's a lot of extra cleaning, but escorting them to the woods first is too dangerous. Paul's overt, suspicious intentions for Will to overreact. I can't blame Will too much here. Paul couldn't accept that Travis popped the door and thus made him dangerous via negligence. Will had to leave. He also couldn't trust Paul not to do something irrational since he knows Paul thinks Andrew is sick and doesn't trust him after the brother comment. Paul never had given Will a pistol to keep in his room. Will must have snuck the pistol in from his home. When Paul was disarmed and Sarah ambushed Will, she should have taken the shot immediately. At that point, there was no negotiation. A round from her rifle would have instantly killed him before he could get a shot off on Paul. A pistol is far easier to quickly draw in close quarters, so Sarah's at a huge disadvantage after they lowered their weapons. That and her rifle is single shot, so one missed shot and she'd be dead. Besides eavesdropping, Travis is a worthless sack of sh**. 
He's like the apocalypse version of Oppum and Saving Private Ryan. This whole time, he never learned how to use a gun, how to fight, how to think, how to coordinate and be a team player with his family. He's crying like a bitch in their bedroom listening to them fight. He fails to realize that if things go sideways for Sarah and Paul, he's fucked too. Kim isn't going to be making visits to his room at night. Will's amateur mistake of sticking his gun out with one hand far enough to easily be taken from him lost him his chance at escape. Instead of killing them instantly, Paul tried to waltz them out to the woods first. Again, from Will's Will's perspective, Paul's clearly intent on executing them. Paul's incapability of understanding other people's perspectives causes him to get baited by Will's soccer player performance. You'd think after disarming someone who had gotten distracted and left their gun out wide, Paul would realize that he shouldn't make the same mistake, but no. Paul also mistakenly tied Will's hands at the front. There's a reason police usually handcuff perps behind their back. It's much more difficult to assault them. When Paul was getting his face caved in by a rock, it took Sarah three or four swings before she shot Will. For the life of me, I don't understand why. Paul had to kill Kim after that, partly for mercy, partly to prevent her from possibly coming after them later or sicking a different tribe of survivors on them. None of this matters though. They most likely are all infected and will die of the Black Death soon. Let's recap the decisions which could have altered who lived and died. The only two actions that would have saved everyone's lives are one, using a proper leash for Stanley, and two, better parenting so Travis wasn't such a soppy loose cannon who knowingly infected everyone. Ultimately, I I think the Black Death from It Comes at Night was beaten. Thanks for watching, and remember, be polite, be professional, but have a plan to kill everybody you meet.